Hey, 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 happy Thursday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, incredibly enough, GamingGang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard, everybody. Tonight is Thursday, April 4th, 2024, this is live stream number 1042. If you're not overly familiar with the show, let me point out super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And then I'll usually pontificate on a topic related to our hobby. Tonight, I am going to discuss why there aren't more people playing Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. I have a few ideas why, and I will be getting into that after we tackle the tabletop gaming news of the day. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit GamingGang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you are not going to find here. Yep, as I bump the keyboard. <laughs> You're not going to find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Now, because this is a live stream, there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And you must be a subscriber in order to take part in chat. It's another way I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you want to say howdy, Maybe you've got a question, a comment, want to take part in the discussion after the news, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. First out the gate tonight is James Eck, Kathy Evans, 245 Trioxin, Matthew Constantine, Flaming Heron, Kevin King, and Jose Fernandez are all with us in chat already. Very nice. Very nice. And I will take a guess. The lovely and talented Miss Sarah D is with us tonight. So Flaming Heron is one of our chat moderators. Sarah D is another of our chat moderators. So they wield the ban hammers. <laughs> Although they really never have to bust them out and use them, thankfully. One of these days, I get a feeling we'll, we'll have uh, somebody come strolling on in because now I don't require you to be a subscriber for two days. I just require you to be a subscriber for five minutes. So there's that. Fleming Heron says the shadows would not be the same without Sarah D. Well, well, well. Crowbar Creative is with us in chat as well. We're going to be talking about their big release that is now available in print. You've already gotten to see a first look at it. I have a review coming this weekend for it, but it is one of our news pieces. And Semper Buffo, as well as Neurolancer are popping on in. I think I just said hello to our friend, Kevin R. Smith. Maybe I didn't, in case I didn't. Hello, Kevin. Yes. Chat is off and running already. So let's jump on into the news because landing in May is Thorgal, the board game. And here's the latest from Portal Games. Thorgal, the board game, is a cooperative storybook adventure game for one to four players, ages 14 and up, and is designed by Joanna Kajanka, Jan 
Mercy and Rafael Zima. Yeah, I guarantee I've mispronounced at least two of those names. Players take on the roles of Thorgal, his wife, Aricia, their son, Jolin, and Chris, a deadly female warrior, and go on a series of adventures. The game, the game consists of seven standalone scenarios, each taking roughly 90 to 120 minutes to play. Scenarios do not form a campaign nor have any legacy features, so they can be played by different playgroups and over an extended period of time. Thurgle the board game comes with a book of maps. Each scenario is played on a different map that players explore while fulfilling scenario goals and promises completely different adventures, hidden opportunities, and vivid characters. Players are free to choose whether they travel in one group or split to cover more areas at the same time. They also perform side quests that might help them win a scenario. Another important feature of the game is the storybook, containing narrative descriptions of the encounters that characters make in each scenario. The adventures described in the book are specific to each scenario and character, yet a lot of them are randomized within a scenario, offering higher replayability and allowing for repeated play. There are also side plots players can pursue to gain benefits and reveal additional pieces of the story. Thorgal, the board game, while having a strong narrative element, offers a brand new unique action selection mechanism. With this new mechanism, actions have varying power depending on which other actions have already been taken. Players carefully plan their strategy and sequence of actions taken as this directly impacts the strength of the effect of each action. This creates an interesting decision space and makes each turn important for everyone at the table. Another important mechanic involves character development. Each character gains experience during the game and advances their abilities. This dynamic progress allows players to make meaningful decisions about how to develop their hero in the game. Characters gather resources and craft objects to help them survive in the dangerous world. Thorgo the board game is for one to four players ages 14 and up. Plays in around 90 to 120 minutes per scenario. It's going to carry an MSRP of $89 when it lands in stores next month. This could be very unique. Pretty interesting as well. I'm glad that Portal Games does make it very apparent a few times in that sell sheet information that there is randomness in these adventures. These adventures, these scenarios are not going to play out the same exact way every single time. I do believe there are also some, I believe some expansions which will also be arriving at the same time for Thorgal, the board game. Sarah D is with us, says they are the terror that flaps in the night. <laughs> Perkins Dearborn and Chuck Terrell are also hanging with the gang. So on to our next news piece. Let's talk about some role-playing game news because now available in print and PDF from, oh, they just happen to be hanging out in chat. Crowbar Creative and Exalted Funeral is Dr. Gord Bort's Scientific Adventure Violence. Here's the skinny. Grab your ray gun, strap in, and blaze your smoking, likely radioactive, trail through the solar system. Blast off into a retro-futuristic pulp sci-fi cosmos, bursting with ray guns, rocket ships, robots. And did we mention ray guns? Based on the comics, art, and universe invented by Widow Workshop's Greg Broadmoor, this is a unique and comprehensive guide to creating outlandish interplanetary adventures compatible with the fifth and fifth and a half editions of some game with dragons and other silly, scientifically unfounded elements. Packed with more than 400 illustrations by Broadmoor and Widow Workshop artists, this technological tome features all 10 5e character classes, but scientized plus five known species and 20 new backgrounds to choose from. 
There are over 125 ray guns, gadgets, gizmos, armor, and adventuring gear. 26 vehicles from tanks and rockets to walkers and airships, plus rules for air-to-air, space-to-space, and orbit-to-ground combat. 61 creatures, 26 NPCs, and several factions vying for power. Eight bizarre and powerful technology types, each with their own unique malfunctions table. Yes, you heard that right. There is malfunctions. And there's actually a book with the tables for the malfunctions, which is available as part of a bundle, or you can buy it separately. Four worlds to explore, each with its own atmospheric conditions, secrets, and plot hooks, plus guidance on creating adventures in the great beyond. Functional yet flavorful custom design digital character sheets by Hans Kleinenberg. This 334 page hardcover with PDF carries an MSRP of $50. If you want to just grab the PDF alone, you can do so for $20. Yes, there are a few questions popping on up in chats which I believe Crowbar Creative might be able to answer for folks. Yes. (laughs) Perkins Dearborn had mentioned that Thorgal, the board game, looks expensive. Lots of good quality components. Actually, for the $90 price tag, it looks like you get a lot. In fact, if you check out the Kickstarter there is an image of everything that comes in the core base game, and it's a lot. In fact, I couldn't really squeeze it in on the slide without it being, like, super thin. <laughs> so Neural Lancer is asking if you can play Dr. Grordbort's scientific adventure violence, Solitaire. I could answer it, but I don't want to steal Crowbar Creative's thunder because, of course, you may recall I shared a first look at Dr. Grord Bort's scientific adventure violence. I have a review coming this weekend of it. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. I will tell you what I think. Matthew Constantine says they love some Flash Gordon slash Buck Rogers type retro science fiction. Plus, this is very tongue-in-cheek. And I should mention, this is not aimed at the kiddies. This is aimed at people who understand that there are certain things which took place in history that, well, yes, you can kind of poke fun at. You don't want to be sitting there being like, oh, well, let me give you this whole long content warning. Yeah, I'm looking at you, colonialism. (laughs) Crowbar Creative says, it's your thunder, Jeff. Have at it. I'm not the one making money off this game. You answer the damn questions from chat, or we'll ban you from chat. No, just joking. Travis Williams is with us. So they haven't been around the past couple of streams. They haven't. I don't know. Did anybody miss Travis? I didn't miss Travis. Teasing. So they just got a new puppy. Although puppy is in quotations. So is it really a dog or is it something else? Are you calling a child a puppy? That's disgusting. Tony Yurkides is with us. Good to see you. Flaming Aaron says, I just want to make Conan in space. Yes, Conan in space. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, move right along. Also now available from Goodman Games is Original Adventures Reincarnated Volume 7, Dark Tower. I've got the scoop. Untold riches, ultimate power, undying glory, and gruesome death can all be found 
in Dark Tower. Dark Tower is an homage to the classic adventure and is a full Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game conversion, plus additional all-new material. A three-volume set presented in a slipcase, these books contain a reprint of the original adventure plus essays from industry luminaries, a full DCC RPG conversion of the classic adventure, and three brand new adventures, The Chosen Sons of Set. This sprawling campaign is suitable for third level and higher characters and can easily be dropped into your own setting. Dark Tower was one of Janelle Jacquet's holy trilogy of adventure books for fantasy role-playing games, along with the Caverns of Thracia and the Book of Treasure Maps. The elder, darker, more complicated sibling, Dark Tower, set the standard for published adventure design in 1980. Jack Hayes crafted a rich, immersive adventure setting that provided tremendous opportunities for, dish, for traditional dungeon exploration, tactical planning, and guerrilla warfare for part-time miniatures gamers, as well as more story-driven role-playing, all wrapped up in a nice, neat package. The Chosen Sons of Set is a continuation of the story started in Dark Tower. If the player characters undertake the quests herein, they can deal a devastating blow to Set's immortality and power base. Or their luck could run out and they could be reduced to a pile of bones left to bleach in the desert sands. As I mentioned, Volume 1 reprints the original Dark Tower with annotations. Volume 2 is a full Dungeon Crawl Classics conversion of Dark Tower. And then Volume 3 features three new DCC adventures which are set in the world of Dark Tower. The slipcase set contains over 675 pages of content across those three hardcovers. It also includes PDFs, and it does carry an MSRP of $109.99. So wait, I should also mention Dungeon Crawl Classics number 105, I believe, is the number, I think it's the latest of the Dungeon Crawl Classics adventures, is actually a prequel adventure to Dark Tower, and it is for second level characters. It's important to note, even though this is part of the original adventures reincarnated lineup, this is not statted for 5e, like the previous six volumes. This is statted for DCC, which I thought was very, very interesting. Very cool, too, to be very honest. But I think the reason why they were able to do that is because this is not a TSR adventure. This was a Judges Guild adventure. And I want to say that weren't there two volumes of Judges Guild material that Goodman Games released as hardcovers? I could have swore there were. I thought they were like larger size hardcovers too. And I'm not sure if those were statted for 5e D&D &D or for Dungeon Crawl Classics. I think they were 5e D&D. &D. Do have to mention, sadly enough, I will not be sharing video coverage of this slipcase set. For one, I, it's way out of my price range. So as much as I would like to continue the streak of the six volumes of OAR that I've shared coverage of, Looks like that is going to end with this. And of course, we've discussed this from time to time. Goodman Games isn't really, yeah, they don't really care that much about reviews from reviewers. And I am fine with that. I have no issue with that. But sadly enough, as much as I would love to get my hands on this, I do not believe that is going to be the case. So Travis is talking about the pup. And says, uh, they are, let's see, going back a little bit. I did see something about the, uh, the pooch was 
up for adoption for more than two months. Good thing it was a no-kill shelter that you were in. <laughs> yep, there you go, Travis says, poor guy was up for adoption for over six days. No one wanted him because he's quite big. Yeah, that stinks. That is stink. That stinks. I hate seeing animals in pounds. I always make sure that whenever I adopt, and I, I don't do dogs. Dogs are too high maintenance for me. I love dogs. Animals love me. Animals and little kids just adore me. I, I've actually had friends or dated women who, you know, had pets and they were like, oh, XYZ hates everybody, so don't feel bad if he or she, you know, tried to bite you or anything like that. Never fails. They always love me. Always love me. Human beings, on the other hand, uh, once they get past the age of like eight, uh, yeah, jury's kind of out then. <laughs> Some discussion about Dark Tower. Of course, most people who are familiar with the OSR or the early days of fantasy role playing games know that Janelle Jacquet's really created something new with the way uh, they designed dungeons. Dungeons did not have the same. There's a term that people used to use that I know she did not like, so I will not utilize that term. But the way that they would create dungeons was a, a specific kind of way really changed how the cartography of dungeons was done. Ziggy, 7800 Pro is joining us. For some reason, I think this might be a first-time visit in chat for Ziggy, 7800 Pro. So welcome aboard. If it's not a first-time visit, it's probably a second-time visit. So thank you for joining us. Let's keep moving along with the news because Onyx Path Publishing and Bundle of Holding have teamed for a new offer which features Chronicles of Darkness, Dark Eras. And I've got the deets on the deal. Adventurer! This new Dark Eras bundle presents dozens of historic settings for the Chronicles of Darkness tabletop role-playing game of gothic horror from Onyx Path Publishing. They've shared the world with monsters for millennia in the time of Alexander the God King Mages fought their secret wars. In Elizabeth's London, vampires built their own empire brick by bloody brick. Before the founding of America, hunters fought enemies within and without. And in the Cold War, as the clock ticked towards Armageddon, we could have been damned by fallen angels. Dark Eras reveals the world throughout its long and storied past. Learn secret histories from the flame-lit Neolithic of the 1970s. From Pharaonic Egypt to the Scandinavian witch trials, from Arthurian Britain to the Great War and beyond. Each setting features character creation rules and story hooks for two or three Chronicles of Darkness game lines, including Vampire the Requiem, Mage the Awakening, Hunter the Vigil, Changeling the Lost, and more. For just $9.95, You'll get all four titles in the starter collection, which have a retail value of $50, as DRM-free PDFs, including the complete Chronicles of Darkness second edition revised core book, the first Dark Eras source book, the Dark Eras storyteller screen, and a collection of short stories, Tales of the Dark Eras. And if you pay more than the current threshold price of $25.21, you'll level up and also get the entire bonus collection with four more titles worth an additional $64, including Dark Eras 2, The Dark Eras Companion, The Chronicles of Darkness Sourcebook Hurt Locker, and a precursor to the Dark Eras line, Victorian Lost. These savings will run through April 18th and 10% of your purchase after gateway fees will be donated to the Diana Jones Award Emerging Designer Program. 
Well, well, well. I have to say I am fairly ignorant of the Dark Era's line for Chronicles of Darkness. And I think part of that is because they're, the like World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness is just so fractured. It's kind of like, uh, so, okay, so we got Vampire the Masquerade, and, okay, we have uh, Changeling, okay, and then we got Mage, we've got Werewolf, and there's all these different publishers involved, and kind of throws me off a bit. Kevin King is with us in chat, and they're also pointing out they're confused. I thought 5th edition Vampire Werewolf Hunter replaced Chronicles of Darkness. I don't think so. I think Onyx Path Publishing still releases Chronicles of Darkness stuff. In fact, didn't they just release a new edition of Hunter the Vigil? I thought they did. Like I said, it, it can get kind of confusing. Kind of confusing. The only one of the World of Darkness role-playing games I ever picked up, and I have discussed this many times, is Vampire the Masquerade when it first came out. And I did pick up some of the splats. Not a bunch, only a few. And I had to be honest, I found it to be very unique. I never ran it. I actually was at a few nightclubs in Chicago where people were LARPing it. And that's not why I was at the nightclub. I just stumbled across that, which was kind of odd. But, yeah, kind of, you know, kind of curious about it. I'm kind of curious about World of Darkness. Although I did review the latest edition of Vampire the Masquerade, did not care for it. Did not like the fact that the player characters are monstrous. There's no way to get around it. There is no way, well, at least uh, you can play it however the hell you want to play it. But as written, the player characters are going to be evil in some way. So just how it works. Steven from Roll for Combat is with us in chat, as is Fritz Bronner. Very welcome to you all. Uh, so I think this might be... I think this is a first time visit from Fritz. I'm not sure that uh, that name isn't ringing a bell, but then again, I'm not always all that great with names. B Horn is with us. Fleming Heron says, Who plays is written? I know. I've yet to run a role playing game exactly as written. I don't run Call of Cthulhu as written. I've Mentioned that umpteen times. Let's move on to our final news piece because now available in print and PDF from Raging Swan Press is the old school Renaissance edition of The Shadowed Keep on the Borderlands. And I've got the dope. Shadowed Keep on the Borderlands is designed for a group of first level characters. The adventure is set in the Duchy of Ashlar, which is part of the Gloomhold campaign setting but can easily be inserted into your own campaign world. The keep's location, a bluff surrounded by dense woodland, is generic enough to fit any but the most atypical campaign. Similarly, the one-time ruler of the fortress is nothing but an adventurer made good, not the scion of some noble house. The Shadow Keep on the Borderlands is a sandbox adventure. The characters can explore the various zones of the keep in almost any order. Thus, the characters will find some areas easier than others. They may never even discover other portions of the complex. Similarly, there is no time pressure during this adventure. The characters can explore the shadowed keep at their leisure. If you'd rather have a faster-paced adventure, consider placing a rival group of black-hearted adventurers in the area, also intent on exploring the ruins. This gives the characters an impetus to explore swiftly and potentially sets up a climactic fight with the rival adventurers somewhere in the ruins. 
Once the party has cleared the keep, the characters can move on to their next adventure, or they can claim the fortress as their own. In this way, the keep can become the focus of an entire campaign as the characters battle to clear the surrounding woodland of enemies or explore the deeper caverns below the keep while repairing the shattered fortress. The obstacles to successfully completing such a task are legion. You can always refer to further adventures for more details. Characters completely exploring the keep and defeating all of its challenges should reach fourth level by the end of the adventure. The 118-page black and white soft cover with PDF is available as a print-on-demand over at DriveThruRPG for $21.95, or you can grab just the PDF alone over at the Raging Swan Press site for $13.95. Now, you might be wondering, Jeff, why didn't you just tell us to get the PDF over at DriveThruRPG? It's print-on-demand there. It's also more expensive there for the PDF, strangely enough. Something like $16.25. It's got kind of an oddball price. Whereas you can get it at the Raging Swan Press site for $13.95. Should also mention, be sure you are getting the updated early 2024 edition. Because there is a town, I believe, in this that is actually kind of fleshed out far more in this 2024 edition as opposed to the late 2023 edition. It'll say so on the cover. I'll be the first to point out, I really have never had an opportunity to check out anything from Raging Swan Press. I've heard good things. I got to admit, their cartography always looks pretty nice. Kind of curious if anybody out there in chat or if you're watching the show after it aired and you have any familiarity with Raging Swan Press, especially for the old school Renaissance releases, let me know. Let me know. I'm kind of curious. I am sort of curious. Matthew Constantine says they're probably going to Go grab, uh, I believe they're talking about Dark Tower for Dungeon Crawl Classics at some point. Dangar the Mighty is joining us tonight. Good to see you. So there is some discussion about World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness, the confusion surrounding it, which, funny enough, actually kind of segues into our topic for tonight, because that comes into play a little bit with Traveler, too, and we're going to be talking about that. But that is it for the news tonight. Of course, I did mention drive through RPG. Don't forget, if you are going to go visit any of the One Bookshelf sites, please stop by at thegaminggang.com first and click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase from drive through RPG or Dungeon Masters Guild, Storytellers Vault, Wargame Vault, what have you, I get 5% of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up to help keep the gaminggang.com around. And of course, if you like this video, if you like the video, if you dig the channel, if you find the gaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, Hell, if you just like what we do, you can always stop on by paypal.me slash the gaming gang to make a small donation. You can always buy me a two liter bottle of soda. Somebody had asked yesterday, what was the soda I was drinking? I was unable to get diet right, so I'm actually drinking zero sugar Pepsi. I grew up in a Pepsi family, so I used to get uh, the, uh, what was it called before? It was with the ginseng and stuff like that. It was still zero sugar, but it wasn't, it was the black, but, oh, Max. I used to pick up Pepsi Max from time to time if I couldn't get diet right, and this is replaced Pepsi Max. I think it's essentially the same soda. 
Anyway, I should mention that Agile Monk, the Madman, Kevin King, Mary Smith, and Joshua Edwards all recently visited paypal.me slash the gaming gang and made not small donations. Big thank you for that. In fact, thanks to everyone who goes and uses the banner ads and or visits paypal.me slash the gaming gang. Much appreciated. So as I mentioned earlier, tonight's topic, I will be asking and discussing why there aren't more people playing Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. We are going to discuss, but first, I think it's time for a brief intermission. It's intermission time, folks. Time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building. Every item a fresh, appetizing taste treat. What's your pleasure, sir or madam, and all you kiddies too? Sandwiches, freshly made from quality ingredients, soft drinks, cool, tangy, and refreshing. A hot dog? There you are, tender, juicy, done to a turn with some fixings. Hamburgers, ma'am? Just the way you like them, meaty, moist, and broiled to perfection. Soft drinks, kiddies? Take your choice, cold, tingly with flavor, all your favorite soft drinks for your selection. Something to eat for everyone, soft drinks to make your evening complete. Delicious, fresh, and satisfying to help your entertainment reach the peak of family fun. I beg your pardon, sir, have we met? Like, uh... Negative. My name's Salami, Dizzy Salami. Salami? Salami. Have you dug my group, the Lunch and Meat Five? No, but I'm glad you're here. This is an SK commercial. SK? Lunch and Meat? Mm -hmm. Oh, SK? Oh, Papa Paul. Scoop it, boop, 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 pure beef and pork. Well, I'm glad to see that you like SK Luncheon Meat. You know, they're made fresh daily of pure beef and pure pork with the perfect touch of rare imported spices. SK Luncheon Meats are deliciously tasty because they're made up to a standard, not down to a price. And the variety, well, it's practically endless. Bologna, spiced luncheon meat, olive loaf. Olive loaf? Yeah. Oh, now there's a singer. Olive loaf is a singer? Oh, yeah. Haven't you dug Olive's new album? No. Olive loaf swings cold porter? <laughs> well, Plastic. olive loaf swings with rye bread and mustard, too, friend. Reminds me of a song I just wrote. Just wrote five really? minutes ago. Really? Oh, yes. Name of it is My Heart Belongs to Beerworth. No. Have you heard it? No. I just wrote it. Listen to this. Oh, SK ham and chicken loaf, bologna and pepper loaf too, and Bavarian style, beerworth. Well, I hope you can get the idea, friends, for a huge variety of the world's most flavorful luncheon meat. Buy SK and taste the difference koalas we make. Hollywood bread. I'm not finished. Watch out where you throw those knives. Are you drinking Wilkinsistant coffee yet? No. Okay, let's try it blindfolded. Now, boys and girls, meet my pals, the Sugar Crisp Bears, in a cartoon starring that three-way treat, Post Sugar Crisp. Cars are waiting, here for the gun. We're on our way to eating fun. Sugar crisp is right at hand. Crisp and crunchy, really grand. Oh, it's dandy. Keep it handy. Breakfast cereal, snack or candy. Post sugar crisp. At breakfast time, add milk or cream. And as a snack, it's just supreme. Or as a candy, hip hooray. The three-way treat that's good every day. Oh, it's yummy in the tummy with a coat of sugar honey. Post sugar crisp. Yep, it's really yummy in the tummy. Ask your mom to get you this great three-way cereal treat. Post sugar crisp. Ralph was cool, man, cool. I'm surprised he didn't have just a cigarette dangling out of his mouth. You know, strangely enough, 
if I remember correctly, I think Rolf was actually the first Muppet to be featured regularly on TV. Not in commercials. I mean, on a, on a variety show. And he was on, if memory serves me correctly, the Jimmy Dean Show. That's a name that most people be like, who? If you remember the Bond film Diamonds Are Forever, Jimmy Dean is the rich guy. He's like the, the Howard Hughes-esque character in that movie. So, yes, he had... I mean, he was, he was actually a pretty well-known entertainer. So, so there's some discussion of various different diet sodas going on. And it looks as if Chris Lundgren's cockatiel buddy is watching the show with us. So, hey there, buddy. <laughs> Friggin' Zerborn says Jimmy Dean sausage is what most people will know. Yep, it is still around. It is definitely still around. Okay, so tonight we're going to discuss why don't more people play Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition? And the reality is there were five reasons that popped immediately to mind when I was thinking about why don't we see more people talking about Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition and playing Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. Now, I'm not saying that it's not a popular role-playing game because it is. It is one of the more popular science fiction role-playing games. But it is one of the original science fiction role-playing games. It came out in the 70s. Of course, Metamorphosis Alpha is considered to be the first of the science fiction role-playing games. As Chris Lundgren says, their cockatiel got excited when I called out his name because he watches the show with Chris. <laughs> Edge for Life is with us, says, lack of marketing? I think that's got a little bit to do with it. A little bit, not a ton. So, like I said, I've got, I've got five things in various, oh, let's say, um, I would say there's, there's varying degrees of severity as far as this goes. <laughs> so number five, I would say, is the confusion over Traveler. There are so many editions of Traveler, and if we even go further back in time, there's more editions of Traveler. So we've got Classic Traveler, and Classic Traveler is still sold, at least in PDF, it is sold, and that was originally released by Game Design Workshop. So, or no, Game Designers Workshop. GDW, pretty well-known company back in the day. They were a big, big-time gaming company. They were, uh, I wouldn't say neck and neck with TSR, but they, they did quite well. And Traveler was kind of their bread and butter. They did board games also. In fact, one of the reasons why... GDW took a downturn and went out of business is because they actually worked with Gary Gygax after Gary got the boot from TSR. They were going to create a fantasy role-playing game and they invested a lot of money into it and then TSR threatened lawsuits. So it was like, okay, wow, 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 wow. Semper Buffo says their two labs, Gracie and Walter, are watching the show. Hello, Gracie. Say goodnight, Gracie. And hello, Walter. Uh, Chris Lundgren says they hardly ever see Traveler in big market stores like Barnes & Noble or Target, like Wizards of the Coast. Well, 
the reality is you're not going to see many role-playing games. You don't see Call of Cthulhu in Walmart. Now, can you order it online at Walmart? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. There's a lot of stuff that you can order through Walmart's website that they don't carry in any stores. So anyway, the, uh, the thing that pulled the rug out from under GDW was they had to shut down this role-playing game that they were almost ready to release. They were just about to go to the printer with it. And it was like, wow. So Matthew Constantine says, well, they're watching with their dog, Mona. Hello, Mona. Just saying hello to everybody's pets. Kevin R. Smith says Call of Cthulhu is in Barnes & Noble now. Well, for as long as Barnes & Noble is still around. <laughs> anyway, so there is confusion with additions because Classic Traveler, you can still pick up Classic Traveler, not the small box set with the little black booklets, which, interestingly enough, is sort of inspired these. So these are not the little black booklets, but they look like the little black booklets that came in Traveler. You currently have Traveler 5, which is from Traveler creator Mark Miller, which I have heard awful things about, but it's more of a, like a toolkit. It's not really a game. It's kind of a mess. We also have the Cepheus engine which is built on classic Traveler mechanics. And I would share more news about the Cepheus engine releases, but they use AI art. So most of you already know that I no longer share news or coverage for games that utilize AI art, or at least that I'm aware that uses AI artwork. But I know a lot of people do like Cepheus Engine. And then, of course, we have the previous edition of Traveler that came out from Mongoose. So that's Mongoose Traveler 1E. If we start looking at some of the older editions, we had Mega Traveler that came out from GDW. We have 2300 AD, which... Sort of is Traveler, but isn't Traveler. It's, I could have swore when it first came out, it was supposed to be like the early history of the Traveler universe. It's when mankind is first taking to the stars. Then I have also heard that, no, that's not the case. So not only is there confusion about Traveler, there's confusion about 2300 AD, which Mongoose Publishing actually also publishes an edition of nowadays too. So like I said, lots and lots of confusion about what traveler should you be playing? And in my opinion, I think it's Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition because I like what they've done. They haven't radically changed the mechanics of the game. The mechanics are still essentially the same as they've been since the beginning. You're rolling two six-sided dice and you're looking to meet or exceed a certain number. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. And normally what you're doing is the level of your skill that you have in that area is going to be added to your die roll. That's it. Chris Lundgren says, damn YouTube ads. And would you imagine it's a Wizards of the Coast commercial? No. <laughs> Doomed Colonist is with us. And by all means, everybody, toss in your two cents in chat. And if you end up watching this after the stream has ended, Share your thoughts in the comment section, too. So, Doom Colonist says, Ah, good old Traveler. I spent a small fortune on Mongoose Traveler, the previous edition. 
only to find their group hated it. Fun times. Matthew Constantine also mentions Traveler New Era, which peeved a ton of folks. Kevin R. Smith says, I thought 2300 AD was another setting using the Traveler system. I know, that's supposed to be, I guess, what it is now. I, p- I picked up the original when it came out from GDW. In fact, strangely enough, Traveler was another one of those games where I would pick up releases for it, even though I didn't run it. I think we tried running original Traveler a handful of times, and we just never got it off the ground. So Semper Buffo says, so if you want to start, which one and what? Right, so there you go. There is your confusion. Flint Fireforge says, never played Traveler, never knew anyone who did play Traveler. (laughs) Chris Lundgren's asking, which is my favorite version? Uh, Now, keep in mind, I don't have a lot of content for Traveler 2nd Edition. In fact, I essentially got the starter set. And I also have the Great Rift was sent to me and somebody was going to review it. I know, I should learn my lesson, right? I kind of have learned my lesson. But I'm always trying to bring more contributors on board. And if they can shoot video, oh. Thank you kindly, right? And then it never comes to pass. Because people realize, you know what? This shit ain't easy. <laughs> right. It doesn't, it's not just, oh yeah, it just it just does its own thing. I don't even put have to put any work into this. This is great. No, they realize, oh wow, there's actually work in reviewing stuff. I have to read things. I gotta play stuff. Crap. So I never got, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's a great rift, which is another box set. And a, like, low experience adventure. Is it something marooned? Something, Something along those lines. But I have reviewed the starter set, really liked it quite a lot. And... It was packed with value, even though this is $70. This is $69.99. We're going to talk about pricing in a few moments. But I think the first thing that prevents more people from playing Traveler is the confusion of what do they play? What do they pick up? Did they pick up Mark Miller's Traveler? I mean, he's the designer. Wouldn't you pick up his? Or would you just pick up PDFs of Classic Traveler. Would you do that? Or are you picking up 2300 AD? That's from Mongoose too. All right, who do we just... Vaughn Moore just popped in the chat. What is the flavor of Traveler's second edition? Space opera, harder science fiction? Boom. We're going to talk about that too. So... Here's the second thing that I think holds people back from playing Traveler. And there is a misconception that Traveler is a very crunchy role-playing game system. I just told you what the core mechanic for action resolution is in Traveler, Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. And that is roll two six-sided dice Add your skill modifier. There might be negative modifiers. There might be other positive modifiers. So there is a little bit of math involved. But you are looking to meet or exceed a number. Like eight. Right, seven or eight. That's all that's to it. But where the complexity does come in is if you are building starships if you are creating worlds and star systems, if you have a group of travelers who are involved in trade, there are so many rules as far as breaking down, you know, their 
their cost and profit and stuff like that. It's like, okay, you realize this is a role-playing game, right? They, they're not really delivering things from one planet to another. So, yeah. So the actual core of the mechanics is simple. It's very easy to, to resolve. It's when you start getting into other things. Now, if you're just going to use starships that are already created, if you're going to buy the supplements that have the various different starships, various different planets, the, the adventures, the campaign books always have the planets and systems already generated, mapped out, things like that then you can ignore some of that complexity. Something else that throws people out off a bit is how the planets are kind of broken up as far as statistics-wise. So there's this long stretch of like letters and numbers that at a glance, if you're familiar with what they represent, then you're like, oh, yeah, okay, so it's this sort of planet, this is the atmosphere, this is the size, this is the tech level, all those sorts of things. But if you're not overly familiar with it, you're looking at it and your eyes might start to glaze over a little. So mechanically not super crunchy. Other sort of tertiary information can be rather complex. So there is that to keep in mind too. Will GM for food is popping on in. Says people aren't playing second edition because LBB and first edition mongoose still do the trick. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah, if you've got older traveler stuff, you got original traveler, like as I said, not that different than traveler second edition. So here's the third reason that I think prevents people or as many people as could be checking out Traveler, playing Traveler. Third thing that I keep, think that keeps people away is that most people look at Traveler, not just Mongoose Traveler 2E, Traveler itself, they look at it as being military science fiction or in some ways, far harder science fiction than it actually is as far as a role-playing game. So people out there who want to play a role-playing game, a science fiction role-playing game that's going to be more space fantasy or space opera, think, oh, well, I can't use Traveler to do that. Traveler's just, everybody's like former military. All the characters are former military. I've heard for decades how your player character can die in character creation because they have a military background. True and not true. Sly Blue Demon's with us. We got a good chat rocking and rolling tonight. Glad to see everybody hanging out. So there is a misconception that you cannot play Traveler as a space opera sort of tabletop role-playing game. And I think it's important to once again mention, and I, I guess nowadays there are far, far more game masters out there who just kind of run things as written. That it's like, oh, well, if this is how this setting is presented, well, then that's how I run this setting. Oh, so... Dungeons and Dragons, I'm going to run Dungeons and Dragons, so it's going to be in the Forgotten Realms. Oh, wait, they, they released an Eberron book? Well, I guess I can use Eberron now, you know, as opposed to those of us who have been around running role-playing games for quite some time, we just sort of say, yeah, I'll do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I like that. I'll cherry-pick that. I'll take that. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving that behind. It's like, eh, nah, 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 no nah, thanks. 
So you can conceivably use Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition for any sort of science fiction role-playing you want. It's just you will have to make adjustments if you are looking to run something that's far more Star Wars in approach than, say, let's see, what's a, what's a good hard science fiction? show or movie series. It's usually novels that that run more, like Hammer Slammers, right? David Drake's series, Hammer Slammers would would pretty easily work in Traveler. Whereas Star Wars, maybe not so much. Star Trek, probably a little easier, a little less that you'd have to make adjustments for. Chris Lundgren says, Jeff, the real question is why is fantasy role-playing games always more popular than science fiction? Yet there are tons of science fiction TV fans, movie fans, so forth. No, that's not the real question. The real question is why aren't more people playing Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition? If Chris would like to start his own stream, he can have his own question. <laughs> Why is fantasy role-playing games more popular than science fiction? (laughs) Master Jedi Dude is joining us. I believe this is a first-time visit in chat for MJD. Says, they remember when Mongoose did Babylon 5, A Call to Arms. Great game, old school, always wanted to try Traveler. Will Jamp for Food says, to be fair, old school merchant characters could die in character creation as well. Yes, like anybody could. But I think it's it's in people's like kind of memory banks or a collective memory that uh, oh it's you know they they died during you know military service. Sumper Buffo says the expanse. There you go. That'd be a, a decent idea of a relatively hard science fiction uh, series that would translate fairly well to Traveler. Of course, it's got its own role-playing game, though. Nero's Fiddle is joining us. It says Alien, the Alien series. So Will GM for Food says the answer to Chris's question is because science fiction intimidates people. I would also say, if you think about it, there are far more avenues of science fiction than there are fantasy. And yes, I know there's epic fantasy, high fantasy, more like low magic fantasy, sword and sorcery fantasy. But it's still rather contained where science fiction is so wide and deep. It's amazing. All you got to do is look at some of the most popular science fiction authors of all time. And all of their stuff is just greatly different. So I got to be honest, I've never really been an uh, Isaac Asimov fan. I always found his, his writing be really dry. Always a huge Ray Bradbury fan, but the reality is even Bradbury's science fiction is fantasy. Doesn't care how the rockets work. <laughs> rockets just work, right? They just fly through space. That's all that matters. Uh, Robert Heinlein? completely different than those other two. So I think that's why fantasy tends to be more popular as far as role-playing games, because it's far easier to just jump on in and play. Ziggy, 7800 Pro says, so what version of the game should they get? Mongoose or the original? Because they're interested in playing or running it. Uh, I will answer that. I've got two more reasons why I think we don't have more people playing Traveler. And my second to last reason is because there is so much content out there. We see it right now. A lot of people in chat talking about, where do I start? Which one do I get? I want to pick up Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. What do I buy? Do I get the starter set? Do I buy the core rule book? What's, what adventures do I pick up first? 
What supplements do I need to have? There is so much out there that it can be overwhelming as far as what to start off with. And one thing that I do see that Mongoose Publishing does is they don't stick with an adventure campaign throughout. And what I mean by that is that you will see there are a handful of various campaigns for Traveler. And they can be like eight, nine adventures long. So there can be a lot going on in these campaigns. But what will happen is like one of the campaign series is the, I want to say it's the Reach Adventures. Once again, as I pointed out, Sadly, I don't have a lot of Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition stuff. I don't have any Traveler stuff outside of that. I lost my little black books long, long ago. But we've got, say, as, as an example, one of the campaigns is the Reach Adventures. So the first adventure comes out for that. And then maybe the second adventure for that comes out. And then all of a sudden, another campaign pops up, and it's the Pirates of Drinax. I think that's how it's pronounced. Okay, so first adventure comes out for that. You're like, oh, cool. Matthew Constantine's rocking out. Good to see ya. We'll hopefully see you next week. So then the first adventure for that comes out. And then all of a sudden, the Wrath of the Ancients, or whatever that adventure campaign is called, First adventure for that comes out. So it's like, um, uh, 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 uh. James Eck points out, original Traveler and Mongoose are very compatible. Yes, they are. Very, very compatible. No doubt about that. So, like I said, too much content out there and there isn't a great source to go to outside of maybe... Seth Skokowski, I know I mispronounced his last name again, but he tackles tons of traveler stuff. And he is certainly an individual who, if you're curious about traveler, I, his videos are gold because he is not a shill. He tells you straight out, hey, this is good. Maybe this isn't so great. Or I like this about it. Didn't care for that too much about it. So fantastic reviews for Traveler stuff there. But Skorkowski, thank you, James. I think I was close on that. Uh, it's You know why I always mispronounce it is because I don't have his name in front of me, right? Because then I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. But anyway, they're a great source of information. Should also mention that Mongoose Publishing has a reputation, which they did earn. I can't tell you necessarily if they've gotten past this, but they had a reputation for some pretty lackluster editing. And some releases would be in varying quality. So you might have something come out, let's say it's... Um, what, what is it, uh, the catalog, the, the equipment catalog. It's a lot of gear and stuff like that. And people might have been like, oh, wow, this was awesome. This is fantastic. This is really what I needed. And then they have another supplement come out, and people are like, uh, man, this, this just didn't feel like there was all that much useful content in it. Once again, I don't know if that is still the case, but few years back, Mongoose pretty much had a reputation of some stuff was just not, it was knocked out of the park and other stuff was okay. So Von Moore asks, is uh, Mongoose Traveler 2E class-based? It is not. Uh, so your character creation, you'll start off and you're essentially going through four-year blocks of experience. So. A lot of times characters will join the military. They might be in the Imperial Navy. They might be in the Scouts. 
Uh, there's a wide variety of different things. You don't have to play a military character. And it's, you'll just gain certain experience, certain skills, certain um, like mustering out roles. It'll get you gear and cash at the end of your character creation. I have to say, in my opinion, the Traveler character creation is some of the most fun character creation there is out there. And you do establish a backstory from your character creation. And there, there are various different events that can take place during your character creation that you can build your backstory on. So Master Jedi Dude says, back in the early 90s, the old joke about Traveler was, he had better bring a slide rule to the table. Back in their college days, they feel old. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Right there with you. So, Kevin R. Smith also points out no edition of Traveler is class-based. No, it's not. And you can pretty much play the sort of character you want to play. So let's get down to the nitty-gritty. The number one reason that I think holds back more people from playing Mongoose Traveler's second edition, and that is pricing, pricing, pricing. People are always talking about how overpriced Traveler's second edition is, and they are not wrong. They are absolutely not wrong. And it's, it's too bad. Because it is just a mongoose publishing thing. Mongoose publishing doesn't matter what it is. It could be paranoia. It could be Traveler. It could be their Space Vikings game. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the title of it. They are all overpriced. And that also kind of tends to be a thing with Role-playing game companies that are located in the UK outside of Modifius Entertainment. Modifius Entertainment tends to tends to, to kind of hold the line pretty well. So, uh, Kramar Creative is rocking on out. Good to have you popping in. And yes, you're very welcome for the coverage of the news. And, of course, I will have the review of Dr. Grodbort's Scientific Adventure Violence this weekend. So stay tuned for that. Doomed Colonist says, Shield Maidens? Yes, Shield Maidens. James X says, Mongoose, known for poor editing and high prices. Yep, just mentioned the editing thing. Like I said, I don't know if they've moved away from that or not. If I remember correctly, in the starter set books, because there's three books in the starter set. And funny enough, the starter set, people were like 70 bucks. Yeah, it'd be nuts. Thing is, the starter set is the core rule book. It's broken up into two books. But it is not like most starter sets where it's like, well, yeah, here's some pre-gen characters and we're going to give you enough rules to, to learn to play the game like every starter set out there. Now it's a box set with three books. So it's got book one, which has the vast majority of your character creation in it. Then your book two, which is essentially your game master stuff. And then we have a campaign fall of Tenath, Tenath, which is the third book. So there is actually a good amount of content in it because you get some pre-gens, you get maps of the system, uh, the Spinward Marshes, if I remember correctly. But the reality is about 20 bucks for each of the books. That's about right for a soft cover of that page count. But the pricing is, is really very high. Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to get any sort of quality from it for the price, but it is something that does turn people off. Now, Omenol is with us, and they mentioned this. I talked about this last night, and I was going to bring this up. The Explorer Edition is a dollar, 
over on Drive Through RPG, and that is that really is the starter set for Traveler Second Edition from Mongoose. That, funny enough, this is really the core rule book and a campaign. The Explorer Edition is the starter set. I think it's like 80 pages, something like that. So what happens from time to time is that you will see bundles of Traveler go on sale in PDF. So it was not that long ago that we had a really fantastic, uh, humble bundle of Traveler releases that I think it got 400 and some dollars worth of PDFs, maybe even more than that, for like $30, $35. So it was a rocking deal. It was really, really sweet deal. But there are people out there who are like, hey, you know what? I want physical books. And if you're looking at getting physical books, yes. Mongoose Traveler 2E can be very, very pricey. So what I would actually recommend Mongoose do if they want to grow Traveler, because it's very possible that Mongoose Publishing looks at it like, you know what? We're in a sweet spot. We like where we're at. We don't want to be bigger. This is fine. This is cool. Then they can ignore this. But myself personally, if I were in charge of Mongoose Publishing, I would look at coming up with a core rule book in 2025 and sell it at cost. Sell it at cost if you need to go through Amazon. If you're concerned about shipping and everything else, go through Amazon, have Amazon do the printing for you. There are a lot of companies out there that do it. We talk about basic fantasy from Chris, Chris, Chris Gonerman. That's good, Jeff. Try to like just mash his name together. Chris Connerman. They do that. That's what I would do. I would look at introducing people to Traveler. And that's why they came up with the Explorer edition for a dollar. Was to introduce Traveler to people. But the thing is, it is a pared down release. And then if you want to get the core rule book, you're looking at paying top dollar. And their PDFs are not inexpensive either. So normally what we see with most publishers, the PDFs are about half the cost of the MSRP of the release, which in my opinion, for all publishers, that's pricey. It really is. If you're just automatically knocking half off for a digital file, I still think it's still kind of pricey. The reality is PDF should probably be somewhere between 25% and 33% of the cost of the physical book. Now, something in Mongoose Publishing's favor is they do also give you PDFs with the physical book. So it's nice that they do that. But unfortunately, the pricing is pretty hefty for their releases. I like Traveler 2nd Edition from Mongoose Publishing. It's my favorite edition of Traveler. I remember Classic Traveler. I had Classic Traveler. I think it is far better presented. It's far easier to understand, and it's far, far easier for your players to get into and to grasp the concepts of. So those are the five reasons why I think we don't see as many people playing Traveler as I think we could see, because it is a really solid science fiction role-playing game. You don't necessarily have to play it as more hard science fiction, you can play some space opera with it. And personally, like I said, I would like to see Mongoose come out 
They could take their 2022 updated core rule book and come up with it if they want to strip some of the artwork out, whatever, but release that through, say, Amazon as a print out where Amazon's doing the printing, sell it for cost, get people on board, checking out Traveler. And I think that would really help grow the game and reevaluate the pricing. Just really reevaluate the pricing. And I get it. There's a, a, tons of original artwork in the books. The artwork is always, for the most part, very, very solid, if not exceptional. I get it. It's not free for that artwork. You got to pay artists and you want to stay away from doing the AI bullshit. But Mongoose, if they want to grow Traveler, they really need to address the pricing discrepancy based on them and just about every other role-playing game company out there. Somebody else had mentioned that uh, they find that Cubicle 7 Entertainment is kind of pricey too. They can be. It's kind of strange because sometimes they'll release a 128-page book and their going price is usually $34.99. And yes, everybody has raised the prices of physical books. It's just something that's taken place because the cost of printing has gone up. Kind of blame the pandemic for much of that, even though we're out of the pandemic. But I was going to say that, strangely enough, you'll see like 124-page hardcover from Cubicle 7 come out. It's $34.99. And then you'll have a 210-page hardcover come out and it's like thirty nine ninety nine. It's kind of like, uh, what? Sort of like, that doesn't seem right. James X said, Far Future Enterprises has a classic version with all the supplements and adventures on a CD or thumb drive for $35. Something there, I would want to make sure that Far Future Enterprises actually has the rights to be selling that. Because it's not unusual to see people selling CDs or DVDs of, because uh, I, I have seen in the past somebody was selling DVDs of Dragon Magazine and DVDs of Dungeon Magazine, and they actually did not have the rights to be selling any of it. Flint Fireforge says, when they think of Traveler, they think of the book series Fool's Company from Robert Asprin. Remember Robert Asprin? Uh, gosh, what was the the Myth Adventures series with the demon? I remember reading a bunch of those. I think there were quite a lot of them in the end. Will GM for Food says, unfortunately, Modifius has snatched up most of the IPs that would fit Traveler well. But as we've talked about in the past, and I don't have that big of an issue with it, but a lot of other people do. It's the 2D20 system. Funny enough, if you took Traveler's mechanics and plugged it into Dune, Fallout, Star Trek Adventures, with all the goodness of those systems with Modifius Entertainment, because Modifius Entertainment does their homework, that is for sure. So when you're checking out any of their IPs, those role-playing games feel like those IPs. Maybe not mechanically. <laughs> Flint Fireforge says it's very tongue-in-cheek and a little goofy like the TV show The Orville. I think I remember reading a couple of Fool's Company books. Uh, Doom Colonist says, I've noted some god-awful quality control issues on Cubicle 7 stuff lately as well. You're talking PDFs or, or print? Because one of the reasons why you're seeing such a long time between the PDF coming out and the print edition rolling out is that Cubicle 7 Entertainment is trying to cut back 
on those issues. Now, I know they changed printers not too long ago as well. World for Combat, who would know this? Steven says it's pricey as printing costs have exploded. Paper is like 500% more expensive from a few years ago. And I should point out, Roll for Combat utilizes some uh, pretty premium paper in the books that I've seen. All right, so James X says FFE is run by Mark Miller. It's legit. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Well, that's, that's fine. And Will Jam for Food says, Fool's Company was way goofier than the Orville. Uh, box sets are crazy expensive, according to Stephen over at RFC. Says the box can cost more than a book. So Will Jam for Food says they loved Cubicle 7's Adventures in Middle Earth. Yeah, see, funny enough, I've got the inside story on that, and I am afraid I'm not allowed to tell you. Not allowed to tell you. Zoom Colonist says, uh, check out the Wrath and Glory hardcover threat assessment Xenos. See what they mean. Absolutely insane amount of typos and design issues. Yeah, you know, I can only handle so many typos in a book and then I start going, mm, start getting irritated. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Kind of get irritated by typos. Just like, this will be the last thing I mentioned, then we'll wrap up for the night. It drives me nuts when I'm reading an article from somewhere and it's, and I've said this many times in the past, and it's obvious there is no editor. There is no one doing any sort of like reading before it's published. And it's, it pisses me off because it's like, it's newspapers, it's The Guardian, it's the Chicago Sun-Times, you know, it's legitimate sources, and it's sort of like, what was I, I was looking at something, I think it was from NBC Chicago, and it was about the Justin Fields trade, and it said, it was something along the lines of, this was after he was traded to Pittsburgh, and it said, that the starting situation for Fields was still up in the air for Chicago. And I was like, no, it's not, because they fucking traded him. How did no one see this? Drives me nuts. Then I sit there, and I'm like, you know, I run a website, and I go through, and I make sure there are no typos, nothing's misspelled. And it's like, I just run a little website. It's like, come on, seriously, CNN? Nobody proofread that before that got up there, huh? So, uh, Will GM for Food said they heard rumors about what happened to Cubicle 7. You know, a couple of guys in the industry as well. Yeah, we won't, we won't get into the whole what happened with uh, Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth with Cubicle 7, because you remember, they were close to going to the printer with the second edition of the One Ring. Anywho, Chris Lundgren asks, are there aliens in Traveler, or is it all humans? No, there's aliens. I think that's something else that I think Traveler could, could work on a little bit, is there aren't a ton of aliens who have, uh, like, I guess, access to interstellar travel. There should be more. So, Flaming Heron says, just love to be in your head now, Jeff. No, you wouldn't. Jim Collins says, I may just be old and grumpy here, but I think if you pay 50 bucks for a hardcover book, you should at least get a run through the spell checker. I'm with you. I agree. Uh, Will GM for Food says the 2022 update for the Mongoose Traveler's second edition core is also missing the stats for battle dress and combat armor. Oh, that's nice. John Harden says Mongoose Traveler is about as good as it gets. Fantastic system, tons of available content. Having said that, they don't get to play it much. 
Well, one of my most popular why you should play videos is why you should play Traveler 2nd Edition from Mongoose. So there you have it. Well, GM for Food does point out the aliens are pretty interesting. There are uh, some pretty interesting aliens. I wish that I wish they had aliens that were like really alien, that were like serious races. Uh, most of their aliens are kind of oh, okay. There's the dog people, and all right, they're like insectoids. All right, so. Omanal oh, says, considering PDFs are released first, you would think they get plenty of free proofreaders. Well, that's what I know Cubicle 7 tries to do now, is they will release a PDF, and it might be nine months before that file goes to the printer. So, Kevin King says, they'd rather have typos than a space game that whiffs on space combat, like Spelljammer! <laughs> Yeah, or planar fantasy adventuring that doesn't go to any other planes like Planescape. Well, GM for Food says, Hivers and Kakri are pretty alien. Well, I mean, like, really bizarrely alien. You know, like, wow. How do they even think that way? Omanal says they think... 2300 AD actually does a better job as far as alien aliens. Doom Colonist says, Mind Jammer does the really alien aliens thing very well. Uh, only thing, I remember I checked out Mind Jammer in PDF once. I, and I thought uh, it just kind of pushed the whole transhumanism thing a little too hard because I'm not really a fan of transhumanism. And it really kind of went overboard on that, if I remember correctly. Of course, Will GM for Food says, if you want really alien intelligences, go for Call of Cthulhu. Yes, the Mego. As a game master, Mego are very fun to run because you can just do about anything you want. It doesn't have to make any sense. And it would make sense to the Migo. All righty. So that is it for this time out. Yes. If you're watching live, thank you very much. Of course, if you watched live and took part in chat, a far bigger thank you because not only are you keeping me company, you're keeping each other company as well. But of course, I know a lot of you out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit GamingGang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more you are not going to find here on the channel. You know the drill. Put your geek on at TheGamingGang.com. If you like the video, by all means, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that bell, because it'll not only let you know when the dispatch streams live, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Why the hell did I say Monday? I know why I said Monday. Because that's why I plan on having my review of Blade Runner Case file number two, Fiery Angels. My review will be up probably on Monday. And I was digging to try to pull it out so I could say, oh. So it'll let you know not only when the dispatch streams live Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it'll also let you know when I upload other videos, such as the review. Yes. All righty. So, of course, if you have an opportunity, be sure to comment on the video as well if you want to share your own thoughts about why there aren't more people playing Mongoose Travelers Second Edition. Everybody enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time of day it is in your neck of the woods. I will be back on Tuesday. 
And as always, I'm Jeff McAleer, and I certainly hope every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang.